Welcome to today's webinar, Engaging Adult Learners in Online Professional Development. My name is Katie Gallagher, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing for Teaching and Learning K-12 at Blackboard. I'll be serving as the moderator for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series this spring. Thank you to Ryan McLaughlin from our field marketing team, who will be helping us out today as well. We'll be joining you for the series this spring, and we're always open to new ideas for topics for the series. So please let us know if you have an interest in presenting for a future session this fall. Just send us an email or a tweet. Each webinar in this series will be recorded. You can search for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series playlist on the Blackboard TV YouTube channel or go to tinyurl.com slash bits K-12 and uh, you'll, you'll also be receiving the recording for the session in a couple days uh, by email, of course, and you can always access PDFs of the session materials in the community site, which I will move to a slide on the community site for you. So you'll be receiving um, information uh, about the session, and you can always go to um, our site on the community site. So we do invite you to go there and get signed up, get part of that group. It's designed to augment the series and create an avenue for ongoing uh, collaboration and dialogue outside of these live sessions. We have many exciting professional development sessions lined up for the spring. Please join us again on Monday, February 22nd at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time with Jan Dickerson from Atlanta, Atlanta Public Schools in Georgia, who will be sharing uh, transparency in the classroom. So we have a lot of great sessions uh, for the remainder of the spring that we'd like you to join us, and please promote these sessions uh, with your colleagues at your district. I'm going to go ahead and put the registration page in the chat as well. And uh, as we move to the next slide, I wanted to be sure that this group was aware that the call for proposals for Blackboard World 2016 is now open. It's open through about February 18th or 19th. So please um, go to the site, consider submitting a, a proposal to present. We're looking to build the best K-12 session that we've uh, sorry, program that we've ever had at Blackboard World to date. Uh, so please be part of that and submit a presentation uh, to present. We're very happy to welcome Patty Savage today to present for us from the Schultz Center in Florida. She has spent 15 years as an elementary teacher, then four as a district administrator in a large urban school district. For the last 13 years, she's focused solely on designing, developing, and delivering professional development for pre-K through 12 educators. She serves as the Blackboard System Administrator and the lead instructional designer overseeing the Schultz Center's online professional development program. When she's not working, she's practicing yoga, walking on the beach, or cooking for her family and friends um, as well. So welcome to Patty. We're so happy to have you with us today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Great. Hi there, everyone. Hi there, everyone. I've got a little, I've got echo, a little echo audio. audio. Um, I hope that you're all happy with the results of the Super Bowl game. I know that I'm feeling a little tired today. Um, so my name's Patty Savage, and the Schultz Center for Teaching and Leadership opened up in 2002 as a teacher training facility in Jacksonville, Florida. And since 2006, we've been designing, delivering, and uh, developing online professional development to teachers across the state. The Schultz Institute is our education brand, and in addition to providing online PD to the K-12 community, we've now expanded into the early childhood community, providing online professional development courses to early childhood teachers and center directors. So with 10 years of providing online learning to adult learners, I'm here to hopefully give you some good advice for engaging online um, engaging your adult learners in your online professional development courses. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about adult learning theory because I think that as, as instructional designers, we really need to give it some thought as we're designing our online courses. Pedagogy, of course, is how children learn, and andragogy, of course, is the method and practice of teaching adult learners. Just real quick, here are some characteristics of adult learners. 
Adults need to have some control over their learning. So you can use self-assessments or maybe have a peer relationship with the instructor and give them multiple options for support. All of that needs to be intentionally planned as you design your online course. Adult learners are usually practical, they resent theory, they need information that can be immediately applicable to their professional needs. Maturity and profound life experiences usually lead to rigidity, which is the enemy of learning. So instructional designers need to provide the why behind new concepts and link that to prior knowledge. Aging does affect learning, and adults tend to learn less rapidly with age. However, if we can link new concepts to already established ones, then promote the need to explore and continue learning. Adults have lived, lived longer, they've seen and done more, and they have a tendency to link their past experiences to anything new. So anything new that you present them, they're going to validate it based on concepts in their prior learning. We need to create excuse me, um, if we can link this together, then we can promote the um, need for learning and exploring. And because of those vast experiences, it's really important in our online courses that we build community. They need to have a community where they can have profound conversations and discussions with each, with each other and have those deep interactions. Learning in adulthood is usually voluntary, so adult learners usually choose to go back to school in order to improve job skills or, and achieve professional growth. So if you can tap into their intrinsic motivation, the more powerful the learning will be. And adult learners do have very high expectations. They want to be taught things that are useful in their work. They expect to receive immediate results. They do not want to waste their time, and I think that that's probably one of the most important things to remember about our adult learners. This is the last slide that we'll spend talking about adult learning, but we need to talk about what motivates them. Adult learners are a very diverse group. Typically, it's ages 25 and older, with a wide range of abilities, educational and cultural backgrounds, responsibilities, and job experiences. So adult learners learn best when they're active contributors to their learning, when the content relates to their current work or life experience. Learn they learn best when they have an opportunity to identify their own learning goals and direct their education. The content needs to make sense to them. It needs to be stuff that they can use immediately. We need to make sure that in our online courses that we allow learners to practice what they learn and that we provide support for self-directed learning. We also need to allow learners to reflect on their learning. We also need to provide learning from multiple sensory channels, and I'll be talking a lot more about that in detail in a little bit later. We also need to make sure that our online courses are safe and free from intimidation. So that said, what are their needs? Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is relevance. Let's take a look at some attributes of effective online professional development, starting with relevance. If a teacher is taking online professional development course, yes? Sorry. I'm sorry. There's a question in the chat on the last slide. Um, so 19 to 20 year olds are not really considered adult. The question is, um, so if not, why? Um, I, th what I've read about adult learners, it really refers to people that are already out of college or maybe may not be traditional students. Um, I think you certainly, there is an argument to say that legally a 21 year old is an adult. Um, but for our purposes, we're talking about people that are typically either have not gone the typical route and gone through high school and college or adults that are going back and taking classes because they want to. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your question. Okay, so if a teacher's taking an online professional development course, the chances are that they're taking that course because they need the points for recertification. At least that's how it is in Florida, or they want something else added on to their existing professional teaching certificate. That said, in effective professional development courses, educators learn strategies that they can implement in their own classrooms, and ultimately that will have a positive impact on their students. That's why we do professional development. So um, educators 
are not interested in theory. They're more interested in practical applications. So like I said, things that they can specifically implement in their classrooms. The takeaway from the online learning must be something that's useful to them, such as maybe a lesson plan that implements learning strategies that they just learned about. Project-based learning works really great for this purpose too. So as you plan your online professional development courses, you might want to begin with the end in mind and ask yourself, what do I want the participants to be able to do upon completion of this course? And better yet, okay, so that will identify your learning objectives and then ask yourself, what will the participants be? What are they going to at the end of the course? And that is going to identify the specific learning outcome. And remember, our learning objectives need to be um, on the critical thinking end. So don't use words like understand, but rather, and I, and I know you all know this, analyze, evaluate, demonstrate, create. Um, and then for our learning outcomes, they need to be measurable and they need to be specific. And because these are adult learners, they need to know exactly what is expected of them. The next thing we need to take a look at is flexibility. I know that our teachers that are taking our courses have reported to us that they prefer online learning over face-to-face -face because of all the flexibility it offers them. They have very busy schedules and sometimes may only have a few minutes to log in real quick and get a little bit of their work done. So we need to shift that culture so that when we're working with adult learners, it's not one size fits all. Instructors need to be mindful that adult learners are preoccupied with other things that are going on in their lives. And while it's important to make sure that they are learning, if someone is having personal issues, it's just best to go ahead and do what you can. Make some accommodations in the course. Give them extra time if they need it. Some additional strategies that allow flexibility include creating learning experiences that can be mastered in small segments of time. I'm sure you all have heard of chunking. Um, so you want to take all of your course content and chunk it into smaller, manageable bites. Provide learners with just-in-time resources as well, such as online support systems like wikis and blogs, so that they can get support when they're in their workplace and they're working on their online course. By the way, Blackboard, of course, has wikis and blogs in the courses, so you can just go ahead and implement them right there in the course. Busy educators are not going to be able to devote long periods of time to working in an online course, especially if they're accessing it during the school day, during their planning time, they might only have 15 to 20 minutes to actually get anything done. So as you develop your online courses, you need to keep that in mind and make sure that the online learning activities that you're planning can fit into a short period of time. Obviously, a busy teacher is not going to have an opportunity or not have the time to sit down and read a 78-page research paper. So we want to chunk that content into smaller bits and make sure that our experiences can be accomplished in about 15 to 20 minutes. This to me is the most important piece of online learning and that is presence. Establishing presence is very important. It's very important and key to engaging your adult learners. The main reason that teachers drop out of or quit online professional development courses is that they feel that they're working in isolation and they feel disconnected from their classmates and their facilitator. So here are some ways that we can establish presence in an online professional development course. Have a discussion board topic where everyone introduces themselves. Have the instructor create a welcome announcement before the start of the course. Have the instructor create a contact with a picture of themselves and have them not only share their professional information, but maybe share a little bit of personal information as well. Have each learning module begin with an introductory video. Have the instructor join in threaded discussions and mention students by their first names. This is really key. We found that when you use their names, they really feel a connection to you as the instructor. Have communi communication norms so that learners know what the turnaround time is for assignments, for example, and uh, they know how often their instructor is going to log in. And they know when to expect feedback on their assignments. 
adult learners need specific feedback as well. So not just a good job or way to go. You need to specifically tell them what they did well in the assignment or what they need to um, improve on. Use formative assessments throughout the course to see how students are doing and also to collect feedback on the course content and the activities. Effective professional learning includes a cycle of continuous improvement. So you can use that feedback to adjust instruction if needed. So to collect this formative assessment information, you can use simple surveys and Blackboard has surveys. You can use an, uh, set up a, an anonymous discussion board topic. You can email them individually. You can create a self-assessment quiz. Um, these are all different ways to collect formative assessments, to collect information from formative assessments. So another note about announcements. I recently participated in some Blackboard training offered by Blackboard, and I learned that it's best to have the course open up to the announcements page instead of the home page especially when you're working with busy teachers. Remember that they probably will not be able to log in every day. So definitely don't put restriction dates on your announcements so that when they log into the course, they see the announcement, um, all the announcements, and the most recent one will be up at the top. But if they miss some, they can read down the list and get all caught up. So we've adopted this practice in all of our online PD courses here at the Schultz Institute. Um, all of our courses open up to the announcements page and we require that all of our facilitators post welcome announcement and then post regularly throughout the life of the course. And something else that we require our facilitators to do to, to establish presence is before the actual start date, like maybe the day before, we have our facilitator mail all of the participants in their online course to go ahead and welcome them to the course and also to provide them with their login information. So presence is super important. So is feedback. Again, I think I said this before, but feedback needs to be personalized and specific. Adult learners need that specific feedback from their instructor. So if you're using a rubric that's not providing personalized um, feedback, then your learners will have little to take away from the course. Providing feedback, oh wait, I want to read this comment. Glad to hear that, yay. Oh, I love that, Liz. Yes, we have learned that and we do it too. Actually, I have a course template that I use and I've gone ahead and set that up in the course template. So whenever I copy it and people start building their courses, that is already established as the class entry point. Okay, so we know that providing specific feedback can be a workload issue for our instructors. So you might want to think about having some institution-wide, have an institution-wide cap on the number of people that you put in your online courses. So what we do here at Schultz Institute is we cap our courses at 25. We feel that 25 is workable. Our instructors can provide feedback to 25 participants that are participating in discussion boards and completing assignments. Okay. And also, your, your institution might want to establish some communication norms, which we have done as well. We require our facilitators to log in at least once every 48 hours, and we, we require that they provide feedback to turned in assignments within three days. Now on the other side of that we also let our, our participants know that if they wait into the last week of the course and turn in everything at once it's not going to all get graded in three days so they need to understand that and all of this is just kind of spelled out for them um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit where, where we put all of this information. What are you going to do if your participants have been trying to contact their facilitator and they're getting no response? You need to have some kind of system in place in case that happens. Someplace in each online course, your learners need to be able to determine how they get assistance if they're not able, if they're not hearing back from their facilitator. Okay. 
Early alert. This is another important piece. Remember, teachers drop out because they feel like they're working in isolation. So you want to keep an eye on how often your participants are logging in. So to help prevent learners from falling behind or dropping the course, instructors should use some sort of early alert system, such as checking the gradebook um, to see whether they are keeping up with the work. Um, what I like to recommend to my instructors is that they use the performance dashboard under evaluation in the control panel. And that just gives them a nice quick little snapshot. They can see when was the last time they accessed the course. They can also see how much of work has been done. And you can even see what they've been posting in the discussion board. So that is a wonderful little tool. And uh, also, Blackboard does have something called the Retention Center. Ooh, sorry about that. I don't know if that was just in my head or if y'all could hear that too. I suddenly had a loud noise. Um, so go ahead and use that Retention Center to monitor students as well. Remember that the main reason that they drop out is because they feel disconnected. So as soon as your instructors notice that someone has fallen behind, they need to reach out to them. So send them an email. Send them multiple emails. Keep asking them what is it that they can do to help them. And um, here at Schultz Institute, if the facilitator is getting nowhere, we ask them to flip that to us. And then I will reach out or someone else will reach out and just see if there's anything we can do to assist these teachers with getting through these online courses. Start here. So one thing I've learned in the last 10 years working with adults is that they don't necessarily know what to click on when they enter their online course. So we want to make it as user friendly as possible. So in each of our online courses, we actually have a button or a link in the course menu that is labeled start here. And uh, in the start here, we go ahead and include information in all of our courses. So all of our courses have the same information in the Start Here button. We figure that if, if they log in and they see that welcome announcement from their facilitator and the welcome announcement says, hey, to get started on this course, click the Start Here button, then that is very user friendly and they won't have any difficulty getting started. Because quite often, you know, it, you don't want them to click the link to their course, get into the course, and then not really know what to do. So in our start here, it links to a learning module that is labeled click here for the course overview. And in the course overview, we include the same type of information that you might see in a course syllabus. So we have a welcome message, specific learning objectives, observable and measurable outcomes, clear expectations. We want them to know what it is exactly that they need to do in order to pass the course and get that credit. Um, many people want a piece of paper in their hands, something that they can print out. So we go ahead and include a, a course syllabus that they can save and they can print off. You need to have information about how many points is this worth? How many hours is this course going to take? If, um, if there are earning CEUs, and for our early learning people, we do award CEUs, um, how many are they going to get? They need specific in information about course navigation, how to get around in this course. What are each of those other links for? What are those other buttons? What do they connect to? Um, how is the course organized? And uh, we also include assessment rubrics. So adults need to know exactly what is expected of them, and they need to know how they're going to be evaluated. So it's very important that you include um, any kind of measurement instruments that you'll be using. Um, we don't have a 24-7 help desk, so it's very important for our courses that we include specific information with how they can get help. And um, we also have all of the technical requirements listed out and links to any plugins that they might need. So for all of our courses, we typically need QuickTime Player, uh, Adobe Reader, and Adobe Flash Player. So we always have links to those in case they need them. And then we also spell out the communication protocol for um, how often is the instructor required to log in, um, when can participants expect feedback on an assignment. We also include information about netiquette. If you're a teacher and you've had a very bad, horrible, no good, awful day, you probably don't need to go to the discussion board and start sounding off about a particular student or parent that's crazy.
crazy. So we spell that out so they know what the expectations are um, in our discussion board activities. Okay. So one of the things I've learned in the years of doing this online learning work is that you should label all of the links. Don't just have it display the file name. For example, you don't want them to see a blue link underlined that just says checklist.pdf. Instead, label that link when you put that document in and let it say, click here to download the checklist. And that's just a lot more user friendly. Again, we want them to not have any doubt in their mind what they're clicking on and why they're clicking it. Um, chunk the content into smaller bits. So make each of these bits a module. One thing we learned when we first started out, we had the content set up in folders and the folders, you know, you might have folders that say that are labeled um, course documents, um, related articles, assignments. And what we found is that since our, um, our target audience primarily were K through 12 teachers, they would see that folder labeled assignments and they would open it up and jump right in and try to complete the assignments without doing any of the readings. So we decided we wanted to kind of make it go more in a more linear, linear fashion. So that's why we organize all of our content into Blackboard Learning modules. And we go ahead and display the table of contents. I don't force completion in sequential order because like, like we have been saying, teachers are very busy, they need that flexibility. So if they're in a module that has 30, 30 pages and they get up to page 14 and then they have you know, to go attend to something like attend a faculty meeting or go and pick up your kids from the media center, then they left off on 14. When they come back to that module, we don't want them to have to click through all 14 pages. Instead, I'd like them to use the table of contents and just jump to the page where they left off. We find that that's just been really well, well received. Teachers really appreciate it. Um, we also are consistent with the naming of our modules. So they're either gonna be named uh, module one, module two, module three, or week one, week two, week three. I have some uh, classes that like to use the word lesson. So they are, their modules are labeled lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. But you want to um, make it pretty obvious that they need to complete the modules in chronological order. The other thing we do now is we embed all of our resources into the pages of the modules. Um, so if there is an assignment, guess what? That assignment is a page in the module. If there's a discussion board activity, the discussion board activity is a page in the module. And uh, we found that 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 works really great. They're not having to hunt around to find these things. They're all right there. You just move from page to page and you get all of the content. Um, the other thing is when using videos from other websites, for example, YouTube, go ahead and embed the videos into the learning module page using the embed code from YouTube. So if you just place a link on the page, hey, click here to go watch the tutorial video about blah, blah, blah. Um, you're sending them off to YouTube, which is like a whole different internet, and then, you know, they're going to get caught up watching viral videos and cute kitten videos. So we want to keep them in our online courses. So rather than sending them to YouTube, we just go ahead and embed the, the video there. Of course, they can click the YouTube icon and wind up at YouTube anyway, but I'm trying to make them stay in our courses as best I can. Um, you want to present content using a variety of uh, methods. So obviously pictures and text, and you can include charts and graphs. Um, we like to include a lot of video and other multimedia components, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, some readings, try to find related websites. Um, if they're downloading uh, PDFs to read, I like to include what I, I call reader-friendly research. So maybe they're articles that are not more than maybe five pages long um, so that they can read them within a short period of time. Um, we also like to include web-based presentations. Um, definitely, you don't want to include anything that requires proprietary software. When we first started this 10 years ago, um, and I was working with content experts, subject matter experts, to develop the online courses, they all wanted to put PowerPoint presentations in them. 
And that's great, but uh, that might work in a face-to-face -face training, but online, PowerPoint is not super friendly. Um, not everybody has PowerPoint on their computers, and not everyone is technologically comfortable to go to Microsoft and download the PowerPoint viewer. So we decided we needed to find an alternative for these PowerPoint presentations. And currently we're using a variety of, of, of um, tools that are available online. If they must use their PowerPoint, then we ask them to upload it uh, to make so that they can just go ahead and embed the presentation in the page in their Blackboard learning module. Okay. So multimedia learning objects are awesome. And this is what we try to do to um, kind of make our courses more engaging. So they're not just downloading PDFs, reading text on a page, and looking at pictures, and watching the occasional video. So we use these different, um, these different tools. OK, so the first one is Vokey. And Vokey is actually a website that provides a free tool. It also provides a not free tool. So you want to make sure when you're signing up for Vokey, you don't sign up for Vokey Classroom, you're signing up for plain old Vokey. And Vokey allows you to make anima animated avatars. So I'm going to go ahead and share Vokey. Let's see. Do I have it? Oops. Hang on. I'm sharing the wrong thing. This is my first time using this newfangled version of Collaborate, and I love it. So here's Vokey. I hope you all can see it. And let me explain what these different items are. They have Vokey Teach, which is a whole different system, and it's not free. And my computer is really slow. Are you using Sorry two monitors? That. Patty, are you using two monitors? I am. But I'm, I've got it on the monitor that had the Collaborate. OK. I'm just seeing a runner on the beach. OK, that is on my extra monitor. Maybe if I turn that monitor off. Or just bring your Firefox window to that monitor where you have Vokey open. Um, they are actually on the same monitor. OK. Oh, darn it. OK. Let me um, stop sharing and let me shut off this monitor. It's a beautiful Oops. picture. <laughs> yeah, I wish that was my beach here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me try again. I've turned off my monitor. And here, Pokey. Now, uh, it, now can you see it? Choose, uh, there we go. Yeah, I'm Got seeing it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So Vokey, I, I love it. I think it is just the f most fun. Um, you can put these little characters in your online courses and have them present some information. So rather than just reading text, maybe on a page where you were just going to have some text that they read, maybe you make the little animated avatar read it instead. So Vokey Teach is not free. That's a whole system. Vokey Presenter is also another tool that they do, that they offer. It's, again, this is not free. Vokey Classroom is an entire learning management system, basically, and uh, like Gradebook and all that kind of stuff. So if you have a need for that, you might want to check that out. Um, I know that most of the educators we work are already using something else. But Vokey are the animated avatars. And I'm going to log in and let you see one. OK. 
So I'm going to take a look at, so I've got a bunch of Okies, as you can see here, tons. We use them in a lot of our online courses. Um, let's take a look at this one. She is talking about word walls. Now, I don't know if the sound is going to come through. Um, the other thing that's kind of neat about the Vokies is that their eyes will follow the mouse, um, which is pretty cool. And when you create a Voki, you can set um, different accents, you can select different characters, and um, if you select, I discovered this, I'm bilingual and speak Spanish, so I wanted to see if I could make my Voki speak in Spanish. And so I selected a voice that said, um, I think it said from Mexico, and then I typed in Spanish, and then I got her to read in Spanish, which was very cool. So I just thought that was really neat. Now the thing to remember, and I'll just show you this real quick, is when you sign up for a free account, you're not going to have access to all of the different characters. You're going to only have access to a select group, but you can modify those. They come in, oh look, he's following my mouse. Good puppy dog. So the kids, imagine kids have a great time with this, but even us as um, instructional, instructional designers and of online PD, we can use these in our, in our courses as well. So I'm going to go ahead and customize this Voki. You can see how easy it is. And I'm going to look for some people. Look at this, it's ridiculous. But it's fun. Um, I found that uh, VIP works really well. Folk, what is that? Oh, here's some people. So, classic. Classic is another one. So the ones that don't have the mortar board are, are available to you with your free account. If they have a little mortar board on them, then they are not free. We can pick our girl or our person. We can give them a different hairstyle. And we can emote over here and change their hair. We can make it a different color. And we can change their mouth. Some of the characters, depending on which character you choose, you might have more options to customize the character. And let her show some teeth. And then we can change clothing. And again, you can use the arrows to click through the different types of clothing available, like sports or casual, uniform, dressy. I usually go with dressy and try to get my people to look kind of professional. And then we can add some bling. So to this character, we can select glasses and we can select some jewelry. So if you feel like putting a pair of glasses on her, I'll give her those. Those look great. And we'll give her a necklace. And depending on the character, the necklace might not show up. See, I had to choose a different one in order for it to show. And when you're done, you hit done. And then you can give it a voice. And there are several ways to do that. You can literally phone it in. You can type it. You can record it. And if you have an existing audio file, you can upload an audio file. And uh, I did, did discover that you can also copy and paste from another document into the text box. You just, and then you come down and you pick the accent and the language. So I'm picking English. And then the voice. We have several voices to choose from. So you can make them speak with an Australian accent or an American accent. We'll go with, let's go with Bridget from the UK. 
and then you hit done. And then the only last thing to do is to change the background and the player. So we can go with, um, there's outdoor and there's indoor, there's nature, there's cityscapes, there's all kinds of stuff. Let's give her a beautiful sunset or mountain range. There we go. And click done. And then if you want to click the player, you have a few choices, not as many. So I can change this player from red to a different color and then hit done. And then when you click publish, you have to give it a name. I'm going to say welcome to Voki. Your scene has been saved. We can X out of that. And I want to point out where you get the embed code. And it does work with Blackboard. I have used it, and it works fine. The only, and here's the embed code. So you want to grab all of that code, and I mean all of it. If you leave out one tiny little thing, it's not going to work. And you're going to copy and paste this into the HTML view of the content editor. Now, once you paste it in there, you're going to need to make sure that you go back and every place where you see HTTP, you need to change it to HTTPS. Just add an S. That's all you have to do. And then it will show up in your online course and it will look great. So that's Vokey. I'm going to get out of here and go back. Oops. Okay, sharing. Here we go. All right. And let's see. Katie, I'm not seeing the presentation. Let me pull that back. Hang on just a second. I sec. am so sorry. No worries. Can be in? Yes, it can. Yes, it absolutely can. The main thing, y'all, is to remember when um, you're using Vokey, Vokey doesn't bring in the HTTPS. So when you um, copy and paste that code into the HTML view of your content editor, you're going to need to back in and add S um, to the HTTP. So one of the other things, let me get back to that slide. Here we go. Um, Animoto is another wonderful tool, um, and Animoto will give you a lot of features if you sign up for an education account. So, Katie, qu quick question. Can I push down the directions for Animoto? Can you push down the what? I'm sorry. I, I have a document, a PDF that has Animoto directions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, you can't push the file down, uh, but we can send it to all of the uh, live participants following the session. Okay, great, because let me tell you this. With Animoto, um, they make it really sneaky. It's very, it's very tricky to set up an education account, but you want to do that instead of just the regular free trial because if you get the education account, you can make full-length videos and you have access to many more templates and um, it's just so much easier. Okay, so we have a question. I feel like I should know this, but where is the HTML view of the content editor? So, um, when you're adding an item, so this is what, what we do here at Schultz Institute. We um, organize all of our content into learning modules within the course. And then as we add content to the learning modules, where we go, we go to build content and then select item. Because that just gives us a little more freedom. That way you have the content editor and you can do everything right there in the content editor. So if I'm adding a link to a web page, I put it in there. If I'm adding a link to a document, I put it in there. If I'm embedding anything, it goes in the content editor. I just find that it's just a lot easier to do it that way. And uh, one day, it was years ago, I was having issues with Blackboard. I was on the phone with um, my technical support guy. And um, he said, listen, don't, don't uh, 
don't add links using web URL and, and all that stuff. He goes, just do everything in the content editor. And I was like, duh, mind blown. So now that's what we do. So when you're looking at the content editor, if you did build content item and now you're looking at your content editor, go ahead and expand the view of the toolbar so that you have all three toolbars. And way over on the right-hand side, there's two buttons in that third toolbar and one is labeled HTML and the other is labeled CSS. So you wanna click on the HTML one and that will give you the HTML code view of that page that you're working on. Okay, ah, we've got somebody demonstrating, perfect. <laughs> okay, so that's great. So Katie, I will give you that, um, Oh, we can put the link if you have a URL. I don't have a URL to my PDF. I just have the PDF. So what I'll do, Katie, is I'll send it to you, and then you can send it out to everybody. Well, so yeah, let me Perfect. So let me show you what Animoto looks like. I can at least log into my account and show you some of the neat things that you can do. Um, fire, we're going to go back to Firefox. Okay, so let me leave, go to Animoto. So I'm already logged in. And let me see, let's look at my videos. And the cool thing about these, um, online little videos that you make is that you can upload them to YouTube, you can embed them in just about everything, and um, they're just really, it's really fun and easy to make really pretty content. So for example, let's take a look at learning objectives and outcomes. It's so funny, I am developing a course that teaches people how to develop courses. That's so meta. Okay, so this is just a little video that I made. Oops. Turn your computer speakers up just a little bit, Patty. Okay, so I've got a headset on. Um, it's buffering, which is like not cool. Okay, I don't know why we're having this problem. I don't know if it's related to you my could, computer. Uh, if you want, you can put the link to the video in the chat and folks can just watch it following the webinar. Sure. I'll do that. So let me get out of here. And chat. There you go. So I love Animoto. I think it's just a wonderful way to create um, little bits of content that are engaging. So basically you pick your template and then you pick your music. Oops, sounds like mine cranked up again. Sorry about that. I had to go back over to Firefox and turn that off. Um, but it's really a, a, just a really neat different way of presenting content. And I find that my adult learners love it. It keeps them engaged. It's something different than just eyes going across text. Um, so you can take the same information that you would present in a document, maybe a shorter document, and just kind of um, put it in a little video. So one of the other things that we do to make our um, courses a little more engaging is, you know, some of our people are so married that they just really want to have a PowerPoint. So a really easy way to um, 
adapt a PowerPoint. Um, first of all, well, you don't want those big, mega long ones because you know how it is if you go to a face-to-face -face training, they've got like a PowerPoint that might have like, you know, a hundred slides. So obviously you don't, you wouldn't want a video that long. So we use something that we call chunking and we chunk the information into more manageable pieces. And then we take each of those pieces and turn it into something. So one of the little pieces might be a Vokey. One of the little pieces might be an Animoto video. One of the little pieces might be a PowerPoint that is turned into a video, just a short one. So we take the slides that we're going to use and you can save your slideshow as JPEGs. And then we, you can use any utility. I'm not sure what it is on an uh, Apple machine because I'm on a PC, but I use Movie Maker all the time. And I just bring in my slides and then add music and narration, whip it into a video, voila, you've got a video that you've made from a PowerPoint. And then if you have a YouTube uh, channel, you can upload it to YouTube and then embed it. Or you can just simply, in Blackboard, you can just add the video. And it's just, just right there. We also use Canva and Slide Story. These are other ways to produce little videos. Um, it's, it's just going to be up to you what, what you like to do, but you definitely want to consider presenting the information in many different formats so that people aren't just reading and downloading PDFs um, so that they're getting the information in other ways. S'more is a really neat thing. You can create free online posters. Um, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, it's just s'more.com. And just you can sign up for a free account and... Um, Get your s'more on. Start making s'mores. Padlet is another uh, free tool that we use quite a bit, actually. And um, here, I'm going to go ahead and do, um, let me see. Let me go ahead and go back out and show you. Um, some Padlets, because I think these are really neat and have a lot of different applications. So I'm going to go to a different website. It's just Padlet.com. And I'm sh everything that I'm showing you is free. Nothing costs anything. So I'm going to take a look at my Padlets. And what we can do is we can go ahead and um, actually put the Padlets, we create Padlets and then put them in our um, courses. So let me see, let's look at this one. So this is just informative. So this is about being aware and responsive. So this is for a course that was written for early child care providers. And this just happened to be, instead of presenting all this text just in a document with one picture, uh, we just went ahead and made a little Padlet out of it. And here's another one. This is called the writing team. These are the duties and responsibilities of the writing team. So this is for a course about building online courses. So I could put all of the information for the subject matter expert, instructional designer, and online course standards in one big document or one page in a Blackboard course, but instead putting it, organizing it like this just makes it a little more attractive, and um, we, we can embed these as well. So when you embed a Padlet, you just go over to Share Export, and you've got your embed code down here. And again, this embed code, you're going to have to do the same thing, add an S where you see HTTP. You just want to add an S and it'll work. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, the Animoto videos come in with the HTTPS already there, so you don't have to do anything to change the code to put it in your Blackboard courses. It'll just go. Okay. Let's see. 
in the content editor you can add to uh, yes absolutely and um let's see can you put up my powerpoint thank you thank you so those are just different things that you can do s'more free online poster padlet i love it we use it a lot um trying to think of other things other things that you can do and if you have the capability to um make videos oops i what did I click on? Sorry. There we go. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, Katie. So you can always um, just use the, the, the HTML code and, and just remember if it doesn't have HTTPS, you're just going to have to add the HTTPS. Okay. So that is all I have. Do you all have any questions? Nope, we're good. If you think of any questions after uh, this presentation, here's my contact information. And please feel free to contact me if you have any specific questions. Oh, thank you, Liz. Thank, thank you all. Yeah, if you, yeah, just send me a quick email. Just say, hey, I forgot how you do this. Or you said something about Animoto and I don't remember what you said. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'm happy to help you out. Uh, we try to make our courses as uh, as entertaining and as possible because, of course, we're dealing with adult learners and they do not like to waste their time. They want to feel like their time is being well spent in the course. So we try to make them as interesting and, and as engaging as possible. Okay. Yeah, Patty, I will reiterate that feedback. This session has been wonderful. Um, thank you so much. I think you. you're able to address most of the questions as they came in throughout the session. Um, so okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, not putting an end to questions here, folks. If you have any and you're typing, please send them through. I'm just going to do a couple wrap-up slides uh, before we close out. We've just got a couple minutes left. But again, um, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or by email if you've got questions or want to have a topic you'd like to see in the future. Um, a reminder, would would love everyone to consider submitting a proposal to present at BB World this summer. We're really trying to build the strongest K-12 program ever, and we need your help to do that. Um, so lastly, uh, that, that's about it. Um, let us know if you have any additional questions in the chat. We'll hang on for another minute or two. But a big thanks to Patty Savage um, for the presentation today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day.